Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of the Philosophy of Volunteerism podcast with me, Danilo, and Jim Limber Davis. Last time we spoke was the very first episode. Uh, I apologize, we didn't mention that. We're going to be planning on doing these talks and conversations in the future, talking more about the more abstract side of, uh, of, of volunteerism and free market capitalism, you know, talking about philosophy and economics and morality and uh, fun stuff like that, right? Not the, not the boring, uh, you know, chewing gum for the mind stuff that you see on TV <laughs> or now sometimes on some YouTube channels. But yeah, so Jim Limber Davis, um, you can find his work on jimlimberdavis.com and on Facebook and YouTube uh, as Liberty Defined. And so we're going to be talking today about peace and compassion and how that relates to anarchism and volunteerism. Why should we talk about this? Why is that even important? How do they relate to anarchism and volunteerism and, and why should they be the goal? What's the purpose? So, uh, so Jim, we're back. So, so maybe we'll start off with what is your, let's say, I guess we should start with basic definitions. I always like to go there. So, so how would you define these terms, peace and compassion? Well, it's, I would just go to the dictionary and see what they have in there. But the peace, just to get beyond what would be explained in the dictionary, peace is, peace is not just the goal of, of getting any of voluntarism. It's part of the goal. It's, it's what you want to have to maintain the very basics that you need to maintain liberty and, and life. Now, uh, the creation and the, abil the ability to enlighten oneself and um, to show compassion is what you would have that would be necessary in order to, to do more than just exist. That's what would fall under living your life. Uh, having peace would be to maintain life, and then compassion would be to, to live life. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people can quite get. I'm still only understanding this myself in sentiment, not able to give you a logically thought out reason for this. And I think a lot of this stems from I'm still dealing with a lot of my own personal demons from when I was a kid. But uh, basically, it's just a if words can heal people and make people laugh, then that means that they can absolutely hurt people as well. And Peace and, and compassion are something that need to be strived. People need to strive for absolutely, and they can't do that unless they have a uh, transparent path of thought progression for what they're actually trying to do. So they need to understand what their goal is to be, what they want, and then go from there. But yeah, I mean, why not just start in a dictionary and see what those words mean first, and then just build from there? That's what I did with with everything else I work with. Right. Yeah, we could do that. So, so one the way I look at peace is, you know, I think about how every tyrant and ruler that sits on the throne of any uh, nation, state, or government, their superficial goal is peace. Right. Hitler's goal was peace. Maybe after all the Jews were exterminated, <laughs> his goal was peace. After all the maybe the, the countries around him bowed down to his will then his goal was peace <laughs> you know like bomba drones enough people in the middle east he's like our goal is peace <laughs> so i think it's important to clarify that uh, like you said peace it's 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 not an, not an end justifies the means peace is the means right we that's where we got to start first right <laughs> so it starts with with non-aggression and with 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 respecting self-ownership and property rights that's really, to me, what ensures peace, right? Some people say the only peace is on the other side of war, right? Which is uh, which reminds me of uh, George Carlin's quote, which is like, um, fighting for peace is like screwing for virginity. <laughs> it's a strange concept, right? And then, and then compassion. Compassion, to me, is, again, to me, it comes down to respect, you know, R respecting other people and wanting them to have the same sort of freedom that you yourself uh, that you want for yourself, right? So it would be quite hypocritical for you to desire freedom and not for you to desire for your neighbor 
And, uh, and to me, that's one of the fundamental hypocrisies of statism is that one person desires to use the state to fulfill his needs, wants, and desires at the expense of their neighbor, right? And so this cannot be compassion at all. Or, or, or you know, the uh, definition of, of compassion as it refers to the welfare state is, you know, I'll rob you and give to him. I'll advocate this politician rob you and give to this person and that's compassion no <laughs> no that's just theft <laughs> right compassion is done voluntarily right big difference so, yeah so 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 compassion to me has a very vital element of having a voluntary interaction to me yeah so i, I think that's interesting that you bring up the introduction of theft into people trying to create peace and i think that that comes down to a piece that i've been working on for a little while uh, about uh, loyalty and, and unity, where a lot of people they want they want to create all these things, and they they have these grandiose plans, but they don't realize that the means don't always justify the ends. They they don't get that. And what I'm what I mean is is that a lot of people will go in and they will they'll try to control every little aspect of that. And what's the quickest? A uh, way to control, but in the moment is always going to be the initiation of some sort of coercive measures, uh, some sort of violence, the introduction of fear into interaction. But that fear has to be continuously implemented on a regular basis. Otherwise, that control starts to fade away. And you can't have this, this, this unity and this real peace until you have loyalty and in order to get loyalty, you have to start with trust. You have to start with that compassion, and you have to exp explain that you're willing to make time to show the other individuals that, hey, look, I, I know you've placed value on your life. You've placed value on it. I see that. I just want you to know that I respect that because I want to make the time to hear what you have to say. I want to make the time to help you, and by doing that, it it builds the bonds of trust, and you build those connections with people, and then you get into you get into loyalty, and then from from loyalty, then you start then you start getting into into grounds where you have where you have possible betrayal, and this is where this is where people get into something that I, I think is really interesting. A lot of people. They don't realize that, that, that loyalty or that reputation isn't just something for video games or it's not something for, for, for famous movie stars and celebrities and stuff like that. Um, you have the connections you want to build with people. You have the trust building and trust is the foundation of loyalty and then it's all about reputation and the management of that. And something, something that uh, I like to bring up is one of my favorite science fiction characters, The Doctor. Um, I once said, after being betrayed by one of his companions, well, wouldn't you like to wh – why wouldn't I help you? You betrayed me. You betrayed my trust. You betrayed our friendship. You betrayed everything that I've ever stood for. You let me down. Why? Do you think I care so little for you that betraying me would make a difference? And that right there, that sentiment of making connections with people where betrayal is – merely a pebble on the expressway that is uh, loyalty is something that I believe so few people can even fathom. In fact, I think it's a part of the problem of people not understanding that simplicity is the start of all great things from the smallest un unidentified subatomic building block of the universe to the very idea that survival is the goal of maintaining life in the first place, that, that survival of, of, of mankind from the hands of other men and women is the ultimate building block of morality. That's, that's the beginning of where everything starts. And I think that that's where compassion comes into play, where we want to make those connections. We want to identify with other people. Say, hey, look, I see that value that you placed on yourself, and I notice it. So how can I help understand that more? And that's where I think it all starts with. And, I, and I'm not sure – I'm not convinced entirely that the overwhelming majority of – of people in many of these liberty movements really truly understand that. I wrote something, uh, shared something the other day on, on my personal timeline, just as a, just as a, just as a amusing to myself, where 
let's see if I can I think I said um, oh uh, I, I think less than half of the self-proclaimed anarchists and voluntarists understand what they preach half as well as they think they do and what they do know is less than half of what they need to understand how much more they need to know mm-hmm. I think I, I, th- I think it's just they don't take time to respect themselves I don't think people take time to explore themselves and because of that I'm not entirely sure because people hide from the problems, their internal problems, their own internal demons. I think because people hide from that, they have absolutely no idea to be comp- how to be compassionate enough with other people struggling to learn certain concepts. But yeah, so the, and then it ends up being let's invoke government. Let's invoke all these nasty, hostile things. Let's just be mean to people. Let's just let's just take the shock value hostility and and coerce somebody else to – bow to us and make us make them listen to us i mean really all it is is saying is that i mean when somebody's like you need to shut up and listen to me or else i'm gonna do this and they call somebody else mean mean names or derogatory names basically what they're asking for is oh you've made fun of me i i think i think i should stop talking and and give you what you want okay i'm sorry that i shouldn't have done that why People, people who are angry and hostile like that, they want to do that. and That is just as much of a problem in the liberty movements as it is with, with political parties who I, which advocate government. So no, it's just, just my thoughts on um, bringing up the uh, people trying to invoke government as that uh, facade for peace. Yeah, yeah, you really – you made me think about how when many people – discover these these principles and these philosophies and they learn about the state and the nature of laws and taxation and regulations the initial reaction is anger and hostility because you feel like or a lot of people feel like they have been deceived and and they don't like that feeling you know you, to, to feel like oh i've been hoodwinked i've been uh, betrayed and so I think the first uh, reaction is anger. But then you have to keep going, right? I think too many people stay in that angry phase. I think that's just self-destructive. So what we, and then later, what I have realized is that true freedom, true anarchism and volunteerism, it starts with the individual. It starts by demonstrating to other people that this philosophy makes me a better person, makes me a happier person, <laughs> makes me thrive and improves my relationships with people because that's what it comes down to, right? But to me, volunteerism just comes down to having relationships with people. Progression is very important and needs to happen. So once we get to that, that place of peace, you know, you, know you, have made, you have made your peace with the state. You know the state is monopoly on violence and all laws are just an opinion with a gun and all taxation is theft and all regulation just strangulates small businesses and politicians are just power-hungry maniacs. Yeah, we know all that. Okay, good. Got it. <laughs> now, let's not wallow in that resentment and anger because that's counterproductive. Let's actually improve the world around us, right? Please dispense with all of this name-calling and insults um, at politicians because, you know, we all know that they're, you know, power-hungry maniacs, of course, but but that doesn't help us, right? So let's move on. Let's start creating a better world. And so that's what I'm more, that's what I'm more keen on. That's what I focus on in my writing, in my, and the way I speak to people is that forget about the future and how we would feel to feed the poor and how would you take care of the elderly and the sick and and all that, and underprivileged, forget about that. Focus on right now. How do you improve the world right now? Just be a nice person. Be kind. <laughs> and and part of that, a big part of that, is stop advocating for the state. <laughs> stop supporting it with your participation. Stop paying taxes. And that's a big part of being a better person. So, yeah. <laughs> you got to be what you want to see in the world. Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure that a lot of people want to do that. I don't know... I'm not saying that they don't want to do that. I'm not. Just, I'm, I'm not just saying they don't want to do that necessarily because they're not understanding just yet that that's what's required to affect a positive change in the world. It's that idea of we need to leave a better world for our children. Well, why not leave better children for the world also? Mm. You have to do one of the same. And they, 
I, and I think I mentioned this to start with, uh, a lot of people don't understand what they're after. So you want to make connections with people and you want to make so that people can understand what they're after. What's the, what's the common denominator of, of every invocation of government? The, the common denominator is always going to be, well, security. It's, it's some kind of security, but from what? And that's what we need to find out. That's what we need to make the connections with. At least that's the success that I've had with people. And people will argue and, and, and they'll bicker with me about it and tell me, oh, well, that's just too simple. But it starts somewhere. Why do we invoke government? And it's because we want peace and security. It's the same thing with the anarchists, the peaceful anarchists, it, even the violent anarchists, even – uh, the voluntarists, it's the same with the Democrats and Republicans and liberals and conservatives and all of them. It's the same with uh, Islam. It's the same with Judaism and Christianity and Buddhism. They, they all want peace and security. The trappings here, the, the, what, what people get lost in, are all the little details piled on top of it. So if you, dig the, if you, if you, if you would dig down deep into the Quran and, and the Bible and the Constitution of the United States and and the Magna Carta, and all of these documents, all they, all the people want is peace and security. That's what they're after. But who it applies to is the is the worry. So for Islam, it seems to apply just on the just looking outside and looking in. It just seems like it applies. It's a very male-dominated culture where the men have the power, not unlike Christianity of old. In the United States, it's, it started out with people who were mostly of European descent, typically white. That's what started out. They Security, all men are created equal. If you're part of that group in Germany, uh, when it was reformed after, after Rome collapsed and, and was united under, I think, Bismarck, uh, it was all about German-speaking people in these particular regions. Uh, it's They all want peace and security and safety. So – they go for the lowest common denominators. Well, lowest common denominator, what's easily visible is going to be appearance. So a lot of people go after that first. But I, I'm pretty sure that if you were to take if you were to take ten black men and ten white men, and you were to take five of each group and make them speak the same language as five from the other group, but all ten men in each group, half and half, spoke different languages, I guarantee you. That the, that the five men in each group who spoke the same language but were different different ethnicity or race, they would start integrating and mingling with one another first. And the reason why is because they're able to find the lowest common denominator of understanding and how to problem solve and reason things out. So if we had five white men and five black men who were, who were speaking English and we had five white men and five black men who were speaking Swahili, the men speaking English would get together regardless of the skin color first. The men speaking Swahili would get together regardless of skin color, mm. and it, that's because it would be able to allow them to alleviate fears. So they would get to that, and I think that's what people don't recognize. They don't they don't see that between the the pro government, the advocates of government, and the dissenters of government. They don't see that common ground. They don't see that they're each trying to get peace and security in the world. They don't see that yet. They just see the superficial stuff, and which leads to the superficial piece that you brought up to start with. Yeah, this, this actually, what you just said, reminds me of the meme. I think you made it where you see like a dragon um, and, a, and a guy with a sword or an axe jumping at him, and it says, I prefer a, a dangerous freedom over a peaceful slavery. Did you make that meme? Uh, I think I did. I, <laughs> I can't or real quick here. It's, I, it's, it, it sounds sorry. very sounds very appropriate to this conversation. Uh, yes, I, I prefer tumultuous liberty, never peaceful security. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So, so yeah. So that idea of why does government exist in the first place? On the uh, you know on the superficial aspect, it's to provide security or peace and security. Right. P people believe that they need this kind of all powerful state enforcing these laws and that that will bring them peace when in fact what often happens is that it often brings about the greatest amount of atrocities and uh, evil that the world has ever seen so so basically the people f because of their desire their 
genuine, sincere, heartfelt desire to achieve peace and cooperation and collaboration produce the exact opposite when they advocate for the state to be that to be that guardian, right? So, so their their desire for peace has been hijacked and subverted and manipulated into something pretty vile and atrocious. Yeah. So, so you know, when people ask, you know, if without, without the government, you know, people are going to be evil and we're going to be, uh, you know, assaulting and murdering and raping each other and, and stealing from each other. No, actually, I think most people want peace. <laughs> most people, that, to me, that's the reason the state was created in the first place is because people were afraid of other people and they just wanted, they just wanted to live in peace. But right. I, I think, I think that is absolutely the deal. And a lot of people, they want this, but they take too much. They, they live too much in the present at the expense of the future. They don't take the time to see, follow through their actions and how this might affect them later on. So they have all this peace and security now, but no future in which to spend it, it, it without being completely and totally locked down and afraid of losing it. So they, they go through. They want peace. They want security. And before they know it, guess what? They have no retirement in which to spend it in because now they can't do anything because it's overly regulated. And it, granted, it takes more than just a generation to get that way, but that's what's happening now in the United States where there was all this wonderful freedom. Even there was all this wonderful freedom, and then Lincoln came along and created a horrible war that was unnecessary, which I will have no problem if people want to argue the lesser of two evils. I have no problem going toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody about why living in the Confederate states would have been much nicer than living in the – the federal, the union states, just because of the amount of freedom that was allowed there um, versus the other. So then, then once that war was over, once uh, martial law was, uh, or, or once the uh, military uh, districts were were removed from the south, um, then peace started thriving and people could do whatever they wanted. But then 1913, and then World War One and Two, and then the Great Depression, and all these people, they lost, they lost all this freedom. It was just gone, overly regulated, mm. and so they had no future to spend it in. They don't understand that you have to find other solutions and don't just, oh, this works for now, but at what expense? So their kids had this great – or they, they had this great, this great amount of freedom where their taxes were low, but their children and their children's children and their children's children after that, they had nothing. They, had, they grew into a society which was all – which, where they had less freedom and, and less freedom and less freedom and nobody even sees it because they're accustomed to the level of freedom that they have. So when they have to pay something silly like a soda tax, well, this is just the way things are. And then fighting that soda tax becomes a, oh, you just, you just don't want to help the fat kids. That's not okay. People don't think about it like that. So they, so they want now in the moment, in the absolute present but at the expense of all that potential for the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when socialists say they want free health care, free housing, free food, free clothes, free, <laughs> free this and that. I saw one guy uh, made a comment on Facebook and he said, the only types of organisms that get those things are either slaves, prisoners, animals, <laughs> Uh, or children, <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> which is interesting, right? <clears throat> and and also you could you could also say if you really want to live in that place, you could go to North Korea, you could go to Cuba, or you could also just go to prison, right? So <laughs> freedom and the the lack of security. I think I think you know. So people say they want security, and so they empower this all powerful state, right? When in fact it security is really an illusion right there is no security there is no job security there is no security when you drive on the road there is no security that you're going to live to see tomorrow nothing is secure nothing is guaranteed right we all live with risk this, this is, something may happen to disrupt our our cozy yes, little worlds I and love that game. Is, oh, oh risk <laughs> oh you meant oh 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 we we live with taking chances oh okay Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so people yeah, they, they I think people a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with this idea of uncertainty of tomorrow, right? That something may happen to disturb 
this pretty little world when in fact something could always happen to disturb your world and and there is never security is an illusion certainty is an illusion right nothing is certain nothing is secure nothing is guaranteed we can take steps to to mitigate risks somewhat but really you know we are at the mercy of nature of happenstance of chance and i think once people can accept that and can say and can accept and, and say to themselves that putting a few power hungry power hungry control freaks into an institution that uh, just uses violence doesn't solve that <laughs> doesn't change that and in fact makes it worse exponentially worse so uh, i think that's an important point <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think security really is an illusion, and I'm kind of glad you brought that up because I was talking about this with somebody else a couple of weeks ago who I work with, and we, we were talking about security being near impossible to achieve, and it, it is an illusion. Think about it like this. It's like, well, what is, what is walking? Walking isn't controlled, really. Walking is basically falling forward and catching yourself every time on your foot. So, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and, and I had this thought when I was watching Toy Story uh, years ago, and uh, Buzz Lightyear was saying, oh, that's not flying, that's falling with style. And then I got to thinking <laughs> about that with the, the uh, walking forward. It's the same thing. It's, it's, it's falling but catching yourself every time, uh -huh. and, and that's, that's exactly what, what the, the illusion of security is all about, where you actually are – you're taking a chance and problem solving in the moment, getting it done. You're figuring out what you need to do. So mm. I think by having all of these regulations and control mechanisms in uh, in place, it actually limits your options for solving those problems on your own mm. and making it so that you now have to depend on this organization that has imposed itself upon you through being handed uh, by being handed down from generation to generation. Well, that's just the way it is. So now you have to go through it. So yeah, I, I think that uh, I think. The, Security would be an illusion, but the ability to solve the problems that give you the feeling of being secure would be to remove all restrictions and regulations on what you can do and be mindful of how your actions work with everybody else's ability to problem solve their own issues as well. I saw I saw a great meme today. It said, and you see two two guys dueling, right? And it says, if dueling was brought back into vogue, a lot less people would say they're offended and get and get angry over every little thing. <laughs> oh, that I absolutely agree with. And that's okay. So I wrote about uh, that uh, that very concept in my book, Liberty Defined, and uh, there was a there was a. Uh, specific passage i think let's see um i think it was i don't remember what chapter it was in but it was something something like this uh, the universal practice of non-aggression will undoubtedly be the cause of occasional loss of life and is much to be regretted on the other hand this custom will render altercations and quarrels of very rare occurrence for when people naturally will naturally become careful i think of what they say and do when another feels justly inclined to consider an irresponsible individual's rights up to including his right to life forfeit. This places the responsibility of one's actions, including critical thinking skills, on each and every individual's, never a centralized authority such as government or any collectivist idea. And I think that plays right into that. Mm. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, definitely does. You, you know, this idea, like w when we talk about a polycentric legal system, right? The first thing when we talk about the immorality of the state, you know, one of the big things is, well, what about courts? You know, you don't want any courts, any judges. I'm like, no. That's not fundamentally, that doesn't have to be from the state, right? You could have, those are just people who render arbitration, solve and resolve disputes. You know, that does not have to be monopolized by the state. And so, again, people think that peace is derived by empowering a monopoly. You know, a group of people, these people are going to solve the problem. These people have all the answers. These people must always be right. And when, in fact, like you said, it actually has the counter effect of limiting options and causing more harm yeah being much more much much more much less efficient 
And so, you know, in the case of judges, how would how would they rise? To, how would a particular judge be more favorable to people? Is the more unbiased they are, the more impartial their decisions, the more they're able to dissect the case irrespective of who the people are, you know, completely objective, as objective they can be as a human being, that really will determine their value as a, as an arbitration, as an agent of, of arbitration. So yeah, that kind of thing is, is that, you know, peace is not derived from a monopoly or, you know, empowering a monopoly on violence. Peace is derived by allowing people to freely associate and make their own choice in the marketplace of ideas, right? Because to me, the only way that civilization has been able to prosper and thrive as much as we have today and, and support the life of 7.5 billion people is because most people in history have chosen the route of peaceful voluntary interaction as opposed to using violence to solve their problems, right? So most people do understand the importance uh, and value of peace. It's just this giant exception called the state <laughs> that most people seem to turn a blind eye. It's like, a, it's like in the, uh, in the, in the blind, blind spot of your, of your rear view mirror, you know, <laughs> they just, they don't see that part. For some reason, the state, it's not included in their, in their perception of what morality applies to. Right. Maybe it's not that I think they probably just don't recognize it. That they don't recognize it because they don't, they don't understand what it is that they're actually trying to achieve. I think that the state uh, government in general and uh, social norms of just accepting something like that are just, maybe people are conditioned for that. They just, they don't, they everything, think just enough, just enough protection security is provided for people so that they don't ever really consider it an issue to think about it or discuss it, just like with, with police and, and, and law enforcement, where the issue is not that when is it okay to shoot a cop? Hmm. The issue is why should I have to? I shouldn't have to, but if I do, then everybody else is going to jump on my case for, well, you obviously don't want them to help protect you. Or you don't want protection in general. No, that's not true. I want protection. I just, I just want uniformly, fairly executed protection. I don't want everybody else out there. And this works into play, I think, with with the idea of, of a judge you brought out, brought up, where you can have all these all these competing firms and organizations working working together, but they're going to have to make connections with the people. They're going to have to build trust. And they're going to build this loyalty with that foundation of trust. And then they're going to have to maintain that reputation of being trustworthy. And it's, again, all going to be about the management of that. I'm not entirely sure people are quite ready for that because they're not understanding what it is that they're doing by advocating things that they don't fully understand, that they don't actually accept but they don't actually advocate at the same time. They just, they just kind of, I'm not sure if apathetic is going to be the right word for that because I think that there needs to be a different, there, it's, it's more than just, it's not enough to be apathy, but it's close enough to where it's borderline for that. And I think people just want to turn a blind eye to it because it's uncomfortable for them. It doesn't make them feel warm and fuzzy or it doesn't at the very least come across as just like Gru's mom. Eh, so I don't know. It's just <laughs> I'm not sure. right. I think people just don't recognize it uh, for a variety of reasons, and and I would be I'm hesitant to say it's all one reason. I think that there's a lot of reasons out there, which is where compassion is going to come into play, and why compassion is going to be absolutely uh, compatible with with the ideas of anarchism and voluntarism. They're going to have to to uh, people are going to have to say, hey, look. <laughs> I know this is what you want because if you didn't want this, you wouldn't be supporting this or being at least apathetic to it despite the fact that it's got some negative consequences, meaning that we're talking to people who support the idea of a state, the, the idea of government where, well, taxation is a necessary evil. No, it's not necessary. It's just forced on you and this is what you want. But what if we had a better way 
And then they get into all the semantics and bickering of, well, that'll never work because this and this and this and that and the other. And uh, so people can't get past that just yet because they're not understanding what it is that they're actually wanting. They just they just maybe take the services of government for granted, and it's kind of just one of those, let's not look at the bad stuff. Let's just look at the good stuff. Maybe that's what maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe they don't even know to look for the bad stuff. And I think I think this is going to be entirely about them not understanding what it is that they're actually seeking. They have no transparent path of thought progression because they have no idea what they're looking for just yet. They're just accepting it as it is. And the I think the the most compassionate thing anybody who's advocating peaceful anarchism or voluntarism can do is to make time to talk to these people and ask them what it, what exactly it is that they want by advocating government or, or, or a state. So I, I don't know. That's 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 a that's going to be a lot of investment of your time, your intellect, and your labor to acquire that. And I'm not entirely sure people are ready for that kind of commitment yet because they're not putting their own oxygen masks on before they can help anybody else. If you don't put mm. your own oxygen mask on in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spiraling out of control aircraft, there's no way that you're guaranteed to be able to help someone put somebody else's on. And because of that, I don't think that they're ready to do that yet. Not mainstream with the liberty movements, at, at least anyway, especially not the libertarian part just yet. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. Definitely, you know, understanding these concepts full well is completely vital before you can convey them to others. I try to talk to people as often as possible about these topics and and you know I, I, I'm able to do it in a non threatening way. I'm not slandering them, attacking them, calling them stupid or sheeple or you know, this is the truth, you know. Nothing like that. Just you know, I just ask questions and to see where they are, gauge where they are. And I always make it I always make it about morality. And also also I always try to find common ground. Like you like you said, everybody strives for peace. That's yeah, that's our that's our common ground is is peace, right? So if we can establish a commonality between us and the other person, then We've already, we uh, we've already said and communicated that you're not my enemy. We both want the same thing, right? So how is it that we have such radically different ways of getting there, and how can we solve this this dilemma that I'm saying that your way is violent, and you're saying no, it's not, it's peaceful. <laughs> so it can't be both, right? It has to be one. So we have to figure out. Let's go back to the beginning, establish basic definitions and principles what you know we have to figure this out so that's why i focus on i focus on morality and i focus on the individual and i say i establish their moral code what do you want do you find it acceptable to use violence to solve your problems no okay what if there there if you hire someone to solve your problem to use violence to solve your problem? no what if you vote for a politician no okay <laughs> that's one and then you know would you advocate robbing someone to to uh, get your currency they say no what if what if you have a group of you 50 of you and you all vote on it and you agree that would that would that make it right sure you can do it but would it make it right and just and they say no so basically most people understand and have this con concept of morality and when i tell it to them that way i usually get the response of you know i i see where you're coming from and that makes sense i'm going to think about it because i think Nobody really wants to support an ideology that can be demonstrated to be violent and harmful to their fellow man. I think that would disturb a lot of people if they do discover that. I think most people want to be logically consistent, and it's just that they have not necessarily thought about these things in that way, right? And so, and so this, com this comes back to compassion, where we have to have compassion with these people who perhaps they're not, you know, they're not stupid, they're not evil they're, they're not malicious right they just haven't thought about these things and i think our job being more knowledgeable and well read into these co topics is to introduce these topics to people in a way that's digestible that's very easy to assimilate that's non-threatening and so that's really what i do I, you know I, I you know i tell people i talk about morality and i talk about economics and i talk about philosophy and and establish basic basic morality so so yeah so that's my focus and so the compassion it starts with the person 
who you're talking to. You know, rather than finding, focusing on what are your differences, we should focus on what we have in common because that is far greater of a percentage. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I'm just not entirely convinced that most people have made time to understand what what their moral code is. I, I don't think people have any idea of, of what morality is, why they even invoke morality in the first place. And this is something that's very common with various liberty groups, especially on, on some of the uh, major uh, online uh, social media sites where people will, oh, well, if you don't know the difference between right and wrong, then you're part of the problem. And I was like, ah, can you at least tell me why you invoke a moral code at all? Right, right. And people are just like, if you don't understand why, then I'm, uh, it's so <laughs> frustrating that, that people will do this. It's, and it's such a simple concept. The, the answer as far as I'm concerned is just that it's about survival of mankind from the destructive hands of mankind. Hmm. That's all morality is. It's just setting boundaries between individuals, spe specifically right now, currently, not counting any alien life that might be reason capable and sentient, but human beings who are able to, to reason things out, have these, these developed cognitive abilities, are able to set boundaries. Hey, look, I take care of me. This is who I am. My body, my mind, my time, this is all me. And I, I want to let you know that I'm not okay with you doing anything with me unless you discuss it with me first. That's setting a boundary. And this is different than other other creatures on, on the planet that we're aware of. But it can actually absolutely be applied to uh, alien life that might also be reason-capable and sentient. So basically this is the idea of the more minds available exist and are not worried about having to protect themselves from other minds that also are reason capable and sentient of their same species, if they don't have to worry about that, then they can devote more time, intellect, and labor and their natural resources to providing whatever else they need for sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. And that is the crux of morality that I promote all of my work on. And I'm not sure a lot of people can do anything even close to understanding what that is just yet. Because they haven't made the time to ask the question, why do I even invoke morality? Why, why, do, I, why do I want liberty? What, do I, what is liberty? Why do I want freedom? What, what, what do I want freedom from? Mm. And people aren't asking these questions. They're just like, no, I'm not free. Like, uh, okay, free from what? <laughs> what do you want freedom from? And I just don't. Most people don't answer – at least I don't think people – most people do. I think most people just go along, ah, that's just the way it is, especially political party advocates and, and participants, again, in, including libertarian uh, party advocates. I don't think they answer these questions enough, or even ask these questions enough. So let's start with that first, I think. Yeah, yeah, and then that's our. I think that's our task as liberty advocates is to is to present these uh, these concepts in a very um, amenable way and uh, demonstrate how they make our lives better. And yeah, exactly. What do you want freedom for? Yeah, what do you want freedom from? <laughs> and why do you want freedom? What's the purpose? You, like, I think a good question to ask people is if they really think that people without laws would become murdering maniacs. The the first question I would ask somebody is. Forget about everyone else. You can't control everyone else. I can't control everyone else. We only can control ourselves. So I'm asking you, what is your moral compass? Do you need laws to tell you to, to distinguish between what right and wrong? Is, is that what you need a law for? The reason that you don't steal, is it because it's illegal or because you understand it to be wrong? <laughs> and... I have yet to meet a person. I, 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 I know they exist. I, I, I've seen some like Cal Molina videos where people have said that they need the law, they, that they would do horrible things if it weren't for laws. But for the most part, <laughs> most people have a pretty uh, basic understanding, pretty firm understanding of morality, and they understand that the laws um, 
don't apply to them, right? It's always the laws apply to someone else, to the next person. The next person is the evil person. <laughs> Everybody I talk to, it's always the next person that's the evil person, right? So that's basically why we need freedom in, in, the way I see it is because, you know, you, we, we understand that the only crimes, the only true crimes are crimes with a victim, right? And all the other tens of thousands of pages in the federal registry and pages of tax law and all the regulations it's all all victimless crimes it's all opinions opinions of some old men and women who seek to control and extort and pillage productive people that's it right <laughs> are they really actually attempting to to make that their goal though is to are they really trying to steal from other people or are they just kind of uh, I'm providing a service, so I deserve a little bit of extra on top of this or whatever. I mean, I think that's I don't I don't think most people in in government offices are actually trying to to steal from people. I really don't think so. Like my parents were state employees um, for 35 plus years. My right. dad was uh, Army National Guard for for almost as long, and their goal was never to steal. Their goal was to make a living. And even though I don't talk with my with my dad at all anymore because we just don't see eye to eye at all i can't get i can't get a have a conversation with them without being told how how horribly wrong and what a disappointment i am and my mom won't talk to me because she has to tiptoe around him all the time and since she's dependent on his retirement she's got to keep things good with there so i kind of suffer in that well where i lose both of them and it's not like it's it has anything to do with other than them facing their own demons and it's not I'm also not saying that what they did was bad for all of their lives or for a big chunk of their lives. It's just a very expensive lesson that ended up hurting a lot of people by saying, I'm going to continue going to work to earn a living despite the fact that other people have to be, have to be held at gunpoint or put in a cage if they don't comply so that I can provide these services regardless of whether or not they can be – provided other in other ways, less uh, destructive or, or, or more peaceful ways. So I don't know. I, I don't think it's – then it goes into people talking about uh, why would you steal from somebody else? If I were to ask them that, they're like, I'm not stealing from anybody. Like, I don't know. Let me ask you. Do you not go up and take somebody's car because it's wrong or because they might retaliate? And feel like they're being a portion of their life, what they had to do to earn whatever wealth or, or fiat currency or whatever they had to get to buy that car, they would feel that that's being stolen from them. Maybe they feel like that's making them a slave to the amount of time it took for them to earn that wealth to acquire that car. So now they're going to retaliate, mm -hmm. which is it. Most people will not go and take something from somebody else out of fear of some kind of retaliation. The retaliation under a state or government is just – the government coming down on them. But without that, and you, the, the quote I had earlier about the, the non-aggression, that's going to come into play where it's more like, uh, I really don't want to be retaliated against. And I think people understand how to make some parts of morality work, hence their invocation of government or and laws, but I don't think they understand why it's invoked. And it comes down to it comes down to this here. It's kind of like, what if I was to say, "Do you know what the square root of sixteen is?" Of course, you're going to tell me what four. Okay, why? Why? Because Most, that's that's four. What four? Four to the fourth fourth power, right? Something like that. I won't go into all the details because it's oh, for, possible. No, okay. for the second power. Sorry, for the second power, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. long story short, to make it simple, it's just the rules of multiplication and division. Yeah. Well, what should we probably know before multiplication and division? Maybe addition and subtraction, right? Right, right. Well, what do you think we need to know before we can add and subtract? Add a count. Exactly. So, why do we count? <laughs> to understand basic quantities the world around us exactly and organize or basic understanding basic quantities would be 
the equivalent of or would be essentially organization. Mm. But why do we organize? <laughs> why do we organize? Hmm, because we, we want I think we want to be productive. We want to be efficient. That's the way things get done, you know. You if you, you want So Yeah, go ahead. If I were to say would it be fair to say to control and manipulate our surroundings in right. order to maintain and improve the quality of our lives? Right. That's why. Mm -hmm. Now, if I tell you, if I if so, when we understand that and we understand why we're labeling things as quant different quantities and adding things up, when we invoke the ideas of multiplication and division, all we're doing is for multiplication is just – we're making it so that we can add larger groups of numbers together faster instead of having to go 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 or 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4. And people don't even understand why in terms of morality and liberty and freedom, I'm not sure it's commonly understood enough as the equivalent would be what is that first 4 plus the second 4? What do each of those numbers represent? Well, the first 4 would be four singles. The second four would be four more singles. So if you were to take those, draw four little lines there, you can add them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, four times four, that's four groups of four. So if you break those all apart, you add them up, you get 16. Mm -hmm. Now, that's people understand that concept of mathematics far more, it seems, than they do why we invoke morality, what hmm. the point is of it. And I think that right there is going to be that I think that right there is going to be the fundamental issue there. So the compassionate part for voluntarism and peaceful anarchism, going all the way back to almost an hour ago, I think now, yeah. it it's all about understanding what are the common grounds, what are the what is the most common the lowest common denominators that we can uh, that we can we can find with other people. And the first, the first one that I think we covered was that we want peace. Now, the second one is going to be why we want peace and how we're going to achieve it. So the why and the how is going to fall under the invocation of the idea of morality, understanding that second part there, peace is what we want, and then compassion. Compassion is going to be the means to it. And um, I think you gave me some other questions. Uh, I think the third question you, you sent me before we started this whole thing was, why should they be the goal? Right. And I, I'm not entirely sure that they should be the goal. I, I don't. I don't think they should be. Um, in fact, I don't think they're going to be the goals at all. I think they're the means to achieving and maintaining them. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate goal is the the goal for the present, the immediate goal for voluntarism and anarchism is the maintenance of life. Specifically, human life, just to start with. Mm -hmm. The, the, the long-term goal, the future goal, is the raising of the pinnacles of success for humanity as individuals, which then bleed over and become successes for the whole of humanity. So that's my take on it from A to Z. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So uh, yeah. So we'll finish up. Um, I'll just give my my closing remarks on um, peace and compassion. Uh, you know, another way I just thought of how I can um, describe compassion would be it's it, to me compassion is a form of love, right? You you love your neighbor, right? You are compassionate toward your neighbor. If you are, then you would not advocate for theft of <laughs> your neighbor's property in any way. Um, and no political euphemism would change that <laughs> fact, right? So, you know, theft being the, the unjustified removal or confiscation of property against their consent. So compassion to me suggests that if I desire peace and freedom for myself, I must also desire peace and freedom for my neighbor. And, and to me, that's the epitome of, of voluntarism and anarchy as I see it, and, you know, peaceful peaceful anarchism very important to specify that nowadays um <laughs> yeah um, yeah so um so yeah this is a great conversation i think a lot of people will derive uh, benefit from it so uh yeah so why don't you give your your final remarks and uh, so we can uh, 
close up? Uh, that's really all I have. I, I just my big thing is that if words can heal and make people laugh, then they can absolutely hurt others. But something that I've been that I've been going on with in terms of trying to better myself is that I think a lot of people think intelligence is is knowing every single fact in the world. Uh, intelligence is is anything is is it's not that at all. Mm. Intelligence is being able to think fast mm. and competing with your previous selves in quality and speed of thought. Mm. In which case, then it creates wisdom, and wisdom is not using every every bit of knowledge that you know to win every battle. Wisdom is going to be about understanding how to use knowledge to not just avert the destruction of war, but to create new allies who can understand true power, that which creates life, the peace to maintain it, and the wealth of connections of loyalty, friendship to enjoy it with. And I think without having that, we're not going to ever be able to have real peace beyond the solution uh, that's presented to us by government. Wow. Beautifully said. Very true. I agree entirely. So uh, if anybody wants to help us out, uh, you can do so through the links down below, Patreon, and uh, hope maybe we'll start a Facebook page for the philosophy of volunteerism. I think that's a good idea. Um, okay. Every good podcast needs a Facebook page. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully, maybe we'll start a Patreon as well. If people want to donate, help us out, help uh, help us spread philosophy and volunteerism to the masses, um, I think that would uh, be a, a big step towards creating a more peaceful and compassionate world. So so um, hopefully there will be a Patreon link uh, by the time this goes public. Um, we'll try to make that happen. So, so thanks a lot, everyone trying to teach people the beautiful concepts of uh, philosophy, economics, and morality, fundamental building blocks of civilization. <laughs> Me and Jim, Jim, we're doing, uh, doing our darndest, uh, you know, uh, cranking out this content for, for all of you. So thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Jim, for a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Uh, so this is uh, Philosophy of Voluntarism. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye.